Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Gene Technology Lecture video number two. Last time in our lecture, we ended talking about diagnosing diseases using restriction enzymes. Um, let's talk about now how and how you actually will be able to actually look at the sizes of the restriction enzymes. So let's do a quick review of what we learned last time. We learned last time, for example, if you're given a mutated gene, an unhealthy gene, and you're given a healthy gene to analyze, and then we give you an, a restriction enzyme. In this case, the restriction enzyme is called Val for Valhalla. And then it gives you the sequence and how it cuts right through the DNA. So then they're all labeled for you here, GGTAC, GGTAC, GGTAC. And it doesn't cut up here because that's GGTAG. That's not a match up there. Okay. So it cuts once in the mutated gene, twice in the healthy gene. All right. This creates two fragments in our mutated genes, two RFLPs, and three RFLPs for our healthy gene is what it creates. When you do that, then you first, so first you cut the DNA and you label the cuts, then you count the number of base pairs, and here they are counted for you, and then you compare them to the numbers down here. So we know that someone with 5, 6, and 15, 5, 6, and 15 would be a healthy person, homozygous dominant, healthy, healthy, all healthy DNA. Someone with 5 and 21 would have the only bad DNA. They'd be unhealthy and have a lowercase a, lowercase a for recessive disease. And this disease is recessive in case you don't remember. And finally, somebody who has all the fragments, all the pieces of DNA, is somebody that has a healthy and an unhealthy gene, and they would be heterozygous and also a carrier. So in reality, how do you look at the DNA? You don't just count base pairs. So in reality, you would take these numbers, 5, 6, and 15, and they would appear in what's called a gel diagram or a gel profile. So this first column here, this is a standardized value we use. Gel, this is, would be a standardized gel. And what it's telling you is wherever these pieces end up will tell you how big of a piece of DNA you have in the form of base pairs. So this one right here, it's between the 14 and this is a 16. Between the 14 and 16, that would make this one the 15. That would make this one the 6. And this is the 5 is right there, 5, 6, and 15. So this person, this is for patient A. This is 5 and 21 for patient B. And patient C has the 5, the 6, the 15, and the 21. This is our, this is our carrier. This is our diseased individual's profile. And this is our healthy person's profile. This is how we would analyze this. So if we ran the profile of another person and they matched one of these, then we would know what situation they have. Now, how do you actually do DNA? How do you separate DNA by size? Well, you got to put it in a gel. And here's what a gel box looks like. It's smaller than a shoe box, basically. You put the DNA in these wells, these little holes. The DNA is inserted in these little holes down here, and you insert it with this thing called a pipette. So it's filling in these little hole, wells or holes in this actual gel. It kind of feels like uh, jello for the most part. You put the DNA in these gel, the wells of the gel, the well, and then the DNA will run through the gel when you zap it with electricity. So that's why it's called a gel electrophoresis. So what does it do? It separates the DNA by size. Small pieces move fast and travel the farthest. So if you look at this, if these are the wells, you put the DNA in these wells, you put the RFLPs in the wells, you're putting DNA after it's been cut. So these are pieces of DNA, or restriction fragments, they may call them. And these fragments of DNA, they go in the well, and then you zap with electricity, and the DNA moves through the well. DNA moves towards a positive charge because DNA has a negative charge. The phosphate in the DNA has a negative three charge, so it has a negative charge. Negative charge things are attracted by the positive towards the opposite. So you put the DNA in here, and it moves this direction. You put DNA in this well, and it moves that direction. And you put DNA in this well, and it moves in that direction. So this creates what's called a DNA profile or a DNA fingerprint of somebody or an inv individual in this case. So you first cut the DNA like we did in our sample problem a little while ago. You can't count the base pairs, so you actually put it in a gel. And where it ends up in the gel will tell you the size of the piece. Small pieces move quick and fast through the gel. So smaller pieces are on this end. 
This right here moved the farthest out of all. This is the smallest piece. This piece right here moved the least. It would be the biggest piece. So, for example, this, this small piece down here, it started here and moved all the way there in the same amount of time it took this piece to just go that far. So this piece is very large. This fragment down here is very small. Okay? Now, in reality, since so much of our DNA matches our neighbor's DNA, if we were to do DNA profiles of people, we would have a lot of the same fragments. A lot of our fragments are going to match up. So in reality, they add what's called a probe to the DNA, the pieces of DNA, so that you can only visualize some or certain pieces of DNA. So what does a probe do? It makes it visual, uh, visible under a, a, a specific type of lamp so that you can see. So they use an X-ray They use an X-ray film, and then you zap it with UV light. Boom! Now you're going to see the actual bands of DNA. These bands of DNA get converted into like a paper version of it, and now you have a profile or a DNA fingerprint of an individual in, in some cases. Okay. Now, this is showing you some samples here. This is crime scene DNA. You'll notice this matches right over here. Suspect number two matches the crime scene perfectly. Here's another DNA profile we're looking at. This is species one. Now, you can use DNA profiles to see species relationships or see which species of organism you might be the close, more, most closely related to. So if you look at this, species one's profile, species two's profile, species three's profile, species four's profile. If you notice, species four and two have some similar DNA, species three and species one have a lot of similarities. So you can look at, um, you can use our genetic profile to look at similarities in species. So what is a DNA fingerprint or a DNA profile, they may call it? Well, this is what I just showed you. Those bands of DNA are showing you a person's RFLPs. They're pieces of DNA, and then they are looked at in a way, and they're analyzed and compared to others. Now, here's a DNA fingerprinting process for you, all right? This is if you're at a crime scene, you first find DNA, all right? Usually before you go cutting the DNA, just so you know, you're probably going to do PCR and make a lot more of it so that you can do this test many times over to validate your results. So technically, before you do any cutting or anything, you're probably going to make more of it, amplify it, do polymerase chain reaction. You obtain DNA, you cut it with restriction enzymes, and you make fragments called RFLPs. You load them in that gel I just showed you a second ago. You run an electric current. RFLPs move away from the well towards the positive side of the gel. The well side has a negative charge. The other side is positive. Large pieces move slowly. They don't move very far. Small pieces move the farthest through the gel. Afterwards, you tag it with a radioactive probe so you can see certain pieces because if you look at all the DNA, it will be very messy. And finally, you expose it to x-ray film, and now you have a DNA profile. So let's look at some. All right. This question is, this is who is the most likely, who's most likely the father of this child based on the profile or fingerprint in the picture? So if you look at a child's DNA, a child's DNA is a combination of mom and dad's. Now, it on a DNA profile, it will not be an exact 50-50 match. So let me give you an example. Child has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven pieces that are visible. You can't even divide that in half. So it's not like one can have five and a half of the pieces and one can have five. So if you notice, the red is from the possible father. One, two, three, four, five, six came from the possible father. One, two, three, four, five came from the possible mother. The wells are up here. These are wells. You put DNA in the wells and the positive electrode is down here. That's because DNA is negative and it moves through the wells towards this positive electrode. Okay, we've created four profiles. One is mom's, one is the child's, and two potential fathers. We don't know who the father is. This is an alleged father situation. A child's DNA either has to come from mom. If it doesn't come from mom, it has to be from dad. Okay, that's how this works. So see this piece of DNA here? Mom doesn't have it, so we know it didn't come from mom. It's, so where did it come from? It had to come from the potential father. Male 2 doesn't even have that piece of DNA. So male 2 right off the bat, not the dad. Because baby's DNA, if it's not from mom, it has to be from dad. This piece had to come from somebody. It came from this person here. This piece of DNA, mom doesn't have it. Dad has it.
This piece, mom has it. Dad doesn't have it. This piece, mom has it. Here's a piece, the father has it. This piece of DNA, that's a fragment, matches here with this father. This one right here, mom, mom, over here, dad, dad, and finally we have a piece here that matches mom. Okay, so if all of the child's pieces are a perfect match combined with mom and dad's, then this is the father. So who is the father? Male number one is the father. Okay, so you are looking at matching the pieces. These are fragments of DNA that belong to the child. You're matching fragments to mom and possible father. If, if one piece doesn't match somewhere, then it is not the uh, alleged father. Okay. Here's another one. Here's a suspect. The suspect is in green. This is their profile. The right here, the blue is the victim. And the evidence is right here. So it's trying to show, you're trying to match that. Does the suspect's DNA match the evidence DNA? And it looks like a match to me. It's a perfect match. And it has to be a perfect match in this case. This is not a mother, father, paternity case. This is all, this is one of those situations where it was the suspect at the crime scene. Here's a paternity case. Here's another one. Here's child's DNA. This one's real simple. Two pieces. This piece came from mom. This piece came from dad. Paternity is established. In this case, this piece came from mom. This piece doesn't match mom, doesn't match dad. Paternity is not established. Okay, here's another one. Mom, child, alleged father. Let's see. Okay, this one here. This piece matches mom. This piece matches this person. This piece doesn't match mom. Doesn't match dad. Hmm. So then this right here proves that this is not the father. Because if mom doesn't have it, then it must come from the dad and the dad doesn't have it. Okay, so this is not the father. Even though a piece matches, this piece here doesn't have any mat does not match up. This fragment does not match up. So therefore, that is not the father. If you look at this one, we have a match, we have a match, we have a match, we have a match. This is the father. Attorneys established here. Attorney is not established on the left. Here's another one. Alleged father one and two. If you look at it, mother, child, father one, father two potential. So you look at it. There's that one. This one doesn't match that one. It matches over here, over here, over here, over there, so on and so forth. All the pieces match. This one, if mom and dad both have it, you assume it came from mom because mom gave birth, so we know that's the mother. Right here, over here. So this one is alleged father number two is the father in this one. Okay, and we will stop there for today.